Hi, my name is Matt Taylor, and I am from a company called Demeta. I'm going to talk about our uh, machine intelligence technology called hierarchical temporal memory. Um, and first off, I just want to say that I have a lot of content. I'm going to go pretty fast, and it's, I'm going to provide you with a, a feeling for how these algorithms work, but not all the exact details about how they work. But I will give you some resources at the end uh, so you'll know where to go to learn more. So let's jump right in. If you have any questions, please use the QA thing. I'm not going to answer them live, but I will come back to them and answer all of them uh, as soon as I can. So, uh, so let me start with some slides. <clears throat> this is called Computing Like the Brain. You'll find out why soon. Uh, so uh, this was back last year in January. Um, Robert McMillan, from the title of a Wired article, said announced that AI has arrived. Um, so maybe uh, maybe he's not thinking that AI is the same thing that I think it is, uh, because I don't think AI has arrived. Because when I think of truly intelligent machines, um, I want them to be able to perform lots of different general tasks, something that can help me with my budget, help me uh, plan my vacation, as well as notify me if like my biorhythms are abnormal or something. So I disagree with this statement. AI has not arrived. We're still in the in the details of trying to figure out what it is and how it's going to be implemented. Um, granted, there's been a really interesting resurgence in uh, AI technology over the past decade um, that's been really cool. Uh, deep learning can do some really interesting things, especially with spatial pattern recognition, image classification, speech recognition, and that has been awesome. But I must posit that machine learning is not intelligence. Uh, everyone has a different definition for intelligence. So my definition of intelligence may be stricter than some, but I don't believe that what we have today is intelligence. And other people agree with me too. Um, this uh, Oriol Vignos from, from DeepMind also says deep learning is not AI. This is from Stanford seminar just from a month or so ago. And the reason that I think it is, is because the neuron model for an artificial neural network is a vastly simplified compared to a biological neuron. Um, and back when ANNs were created, we didn't know a lot about how the brain works. Since then, it's been decades, we've learned a massive amount um, on about neuroscience, about how neurons interact with each other, about how the neocortex works. So our model of an HTM neuron is much more complex. And so this is one of the reasons that I state, I, I don't think current machine learning techniques based upon this simple neuron model is gonna produce what some people call strong AI. Now, our mission at my company is dual. One is to understand how intelligence works in biology, in the mammalian neocortex. And two is to create software based upon those principles. So we're very focused on biologically plausible, biologically constrained algorithms for creating intelligence. Not so focused on results. We're much more focused on creating something that's biologically plausible and we're trying to create interesting things along the way. I believe that these biologically constrained methods of creating intelligence have a much higher chance of producing what we would refer to as strong AI. I hope that you're here to learn more about this alternative approach because that's what I'm going to talk about. So um, getting these algorithms right takes us a long way towards a working system because of the homogenous nature of cortical tissue. So let's talk about brains a little bit. Here's a cross section of the cortex. And one of the interesting things that you see is uh, the cortex has a rather homogenous structure throughout. And if you look inside of this, it's a cellular structure and each one of these cells is a, is a neuron. And we're, we're trying to take advantage of this idea that this homogenous structure that exists throughout the cortex has a common set of learning algorithms that applies to all sensory input and uh, all input coming from other regions of the cortex. So that is part of our, uh, our idea here. So I'm going to jump right into some of this theory. And it's it's based entirely on this idea of sparse distributed representation. So this is the data medium. I like to call it a data medium of the brain. So think about it like this. Um, every section of cortex in your head, you just take a, little, a small section of cortex, 
it's getting feed forward input from a ton of different nerves, uh, nerve axons. This is sort of like fiber optics cable. If each, each section of cortex has a, a view to this, this part of a fiber optics cable, each fiber in that cable could represent a neuron, whether the, the optic is lit or not, is on or not, means that the neuron is active. Also, each bit has some semantic meaning. It means something in some context. Now, the cortex has no idea where these feedforward inputs are coming from. They could be coming from senses, so they could be coming from other regions of the cortex, and also has no idea what they mean. It has to learn that over time. So that is part of the problem we're trying to solve here. So I'm gonna talk about SDRs. I'm gonna show you some visualizations of SDRs, uh, starting with an SDR's capacity. Um, all of these visualizations uh, you'll be able to see uh, as well. I'll give you links to the, the, them after the presentation. But here's an example. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create an SDR. So think about that fiber optics cable. That's what I'm talking about here. This is like a representation of a fiber optics cable. It's just a bit array. It's a bit array of 2048 bits. Right now, only five of them are on. And I can change this. If we want to make it more brain-like, we make it about 2% because that's the typically in your brain how many neurons are active at any point in time. So my point here is with a representation of a sparsity uh, within this sparse distributed representation, um, the capacity of this particular input at 2048 bits is astronomically large. It's very, very big. You're, you will never ever run out of ways to encode data in this space if we're using you know, 40 bits and uh, 2048 bits. So my point here is this medium is enormous. Okay. Um, now, another interesting thing here that's very important is understanding how to compare these SDRs. So uh, the properties of SDRs lean, uh, make, us, um, make it possible for us to do really interesting comparisons. Um, the, the primary one is an overlap score. So we've got uh, one SDR on the left, one on the right, and then this one over here on the far right is their comparison. So what, what I'm showing right now is an overlap that is essentially a binary and, meaning that if the bit is on in both of these spaces, it will be on in this space. So this gives us an indication, knowing that 11 of these bits are similar between these two SDRs, it gives us an indication of similarity. And, and uh, not just whether similar or not, but sort of an analog representation of similarity. We can also show a union, which is a binary or, um, to sort of combine the semantics of these two bits as well. So the overlap score is more important. That's what I want to emphasize because we're going to compare SDRs uh, right here, or, uh, the next one. So let's talk a bit about um, matching. So in this example, I have uh, an SDR, an original SDR on the right, or on the left, excuse me. And in the middle here, um, I have added 33% noise. So a third of these bits are wrong. You know, they don't match the original. And what I want to show here is I'm going to compare them both and show their overlap score. So because of the noise, if, if there were no noise at all, uh, zero, the overlap score would be 40, right? Because uh, there, there's, there's no noise. It's exactly right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add some noise. The overlap score is now 27. Um, so the idea here is that uh, sparse distributed representations are uh, noise tolerant because I don't have to match every single bit. I can move my theta, theta being how many of those bits need to be the same before I will consider them the same. Um, so I'm gonna change that to 27 so that this one matches. So with 33% noise, I can get a match here. And the probability of this being a false positive match is again, astronomically small. So we have this property of being able to match SDRs and recognize whether we have seen an SDR or not, even with the presence of a, a decent amount of noise. Let's, let's bump it up to like 70%, move my theta down until uh, we have a match somewhere around here. So in this case, even with 71% noise, I can still recognize this and a chance of the being a false positive is still very small, uh, 1.9 times 10 to the negative 12th. So it, these, this medium of sparse distributed representations is very um, noise tolerant. 
Now I'm going to show you how it is fault tolerant. Um, I'm going to make this bigger. So uh, on the left, we have an original SDR. And I'm going to show you how I don't even need to compare all of the bits in that original SDR. I could subsample it. So I'm going to take 50% of those bits. I'm going to throw this one away and just use these 50%. And then I'm going to take a random SDR here, uh, and uh, and I'll show the comparison over here. What's the overlap? And this button just like throws another random SDR there and shows you the overlap. The point I'm trying to make here is that if I saw the original SDR, I would definitely uh, be able to match against it um, because my data is 10, and uh, I mean we have control over this. We can change it to whatever we want, but. Um, in the presence of faults, if some of those neurons aren't just stop working, right? Um, the, the inputs to uh, the neuron that's observing this STR uh, just stop working, it, it will still, for the most part, work up to a point uh, because of the fault tolerant nature of SDR. And in this case, with these settings, the chance of a false positive showing up in this random space is again very small, three times, uh, three point eight times ten to the negative thirteen, and uh, so my point being that sparse distributed representations are both fault tolerant and noise tolerant, and these are a a key communications medium um, in uh, in the brain. This is all taken from how the brain works. <clears throat> so uh, these these. Uh, Someone is, is chatting about what do these represent, right? So each one of these bits is going to represent some semantic meaning. But let me let me explain this. I'll try to explain this a little bit better. If we get a false match, um, let's see. Let's do this. Let me go sub. Yeah, sure. So if for some reason I get a, a random SDR here. And I and one in however many million billion chances, one of them is falsely matched. That means that the semantics of that specific data point is similar enough to what we have stored that it probably doesn't matter because it's all of these SDRs have semantic meaning. They mean something. All the bits mean something. So if this random thing that comes in, if we miscategorize it, we think it is something that we've seen, but it's not it's probably close enough to the thing that we have seen that it doesn't matter. Uh, if you think about, you see a furry thing in the side of your vision, it may be a dog, it may be a cat, you know it's some type of mammal, it doesn't really matter. It's sort of like that. Uh, okay, so I have to keep going. Um, again, use q and I'll answer all your questions and I'll tell you where you can answer, ask more questions later. Um, so now we're gonna talk about encoding data into SDRs and keeping the semantic meaning. Um, so this is, part of the hard thing to do with HTM systems and it's encoding data. So for example, this is encoding an ins a scalar value between one and 100. And here's the value I'm encoding. As, as you can see, uh, here's 26 and I'll just, I'll turn comparison on and I'll skip forward to 27. And you can see that there's a, a three bit difference between 26 and 27. Semantically, 26 and 27 in this representation are similar. Right. If I jump ahead to from 31 to 49, those are not. There's no overlap there, so there will be no semantic similarity between these two. Um, I could change the size of the bucket in which I'm representing these values so that the difference between, for example, 34 and 52 does have some semantic similarity. It really all depends on uh, your input space and how you need to how you think you need to uh, encode the data is 38 very close to 39 it really depends on on the problem space um, so this is, is an example of a, a very simple scalar encoding mechanism <clears throat> and there's more than one way you can do this uh, here's another scalar encoding mechanism that uh, distributes that bucket throughout the space and uh, expands, so you don't have to give it a minimum and max value. Uh, it, it sort of expands by itself. Um, and this is called a random distributed scalar encoder. So as you can see, the, the difference between 510 and 511 is just one bit. If I jump ahead, there's a big difference. There's only one bit between 588 and 511 that is similar. So it's very dissimilar, these two. 
So there's different ways uh, for encoding different things. And these are just two methods of doing it. One more encoder that I want to show you <coughs> is a date encoder. And this shows you how different encodings can be combined to encode different semantics. So here's an encoding of day of week. Here's one for whether the day is a weekend or not. This is time of day and season. And as I move this day forward, you can see the day of week semantics are changing. And as I go to a weekend, the weekend semantics change. And as I move from September to October, the season semantics change, right? So I'm encoding all of this semantic information, day of week, weekend, and time of day, if I go and start moving the time of day. And those are all being combined, just concatenated into this encoding, which encompasses all of that semantic meaning. So this entire encoding has day of week, it has weekend, it has time of day, and it has the season all encoded within. So that these are just some encoding methods that could be used to translate a problem space into a sparse distributed representation so that an HGM system can operate upon it. So now we're going to get into some of the actual algorithms. I'm going to talk now about uh, spatial pooling. So the major goals of spatial pooling are, number one, you have to translate that input space into another space with a fixed sparsity because the input space could be very chaotic. It may change over time. It may be 10% bits on at one point, maybe 50% bits on at one point. So you have to translate that into a normalized um, space that we can have algorithms run against. And I think that'll make more sense as I go along. Um, and the other major thing it needs to do is make sure that all those semantics that exist within that input space are translated so that the new space has the same semantics. That basically the overlap properties of the input space are uh, retained in the output. So let's explore the input space to the spatial pooler. I think I've already sort of explained this. So this is sort of like real data. This is a way that you might encode real scalar streaming data. So here, this is power consumption of a building over time. Um, and you can see on the left here, uh, the power consumption, the time of day, whether it's a weekend or not. And those are the only things I'm encoding, time of day, weekend, and the consumption. And in the input space down there, you can see it changing as I, as I move this along. Uh, this is the power consumption is going up and down with uh, the days, and then time of day and weekend are also represented down there. So the thing I want to uh, explain here is th this is just one way to represent this particular stream of data in the input space. There could be hundreds of ways to represent this. This is the way I've chosen to do it. I could also use that random distributed scalar encoder that I showed earlier to encode the power, and that would work just fine because that encodes the semantic information just the same way that the other one does, just with the bits distributed throughout. Um, there could be hundreds of other ways to, to take this particular data set and, and express it in this medium. Um, I'm just showing you this as an example. So the spatial pooler, and here's where we really start getting into the meat of HTM theory. Remember, this is meant to translate an input space into a space that has a, a normalized sparsity, and we call this uh, the spatial pooler's columns. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, but each one of these bits in the columns represents a mini column in the neocortex. And a mini column is uh, just a, a bunch of different neurons sort of stack on top of each other that share a dendritic segment to the input space. So for example, this column that I'm highlighting right here um, has a specific relationship to this input space. Right now, I'm showing I'm highlighting all of the potential cells in the input space that this column might be connected to because it's sort of randomly initialized. And each, each column in this spatial pooler is randomly potentially connected to uh, a different set of the input space. They're all just randomly initialized. Now, I also want to show you that when I click on this, let me turn these lines off, um, that right now uh, this column also is initially created and has connections already. Um, so these blue dots represent a connection from this column to this cell in the input space. And these are based on permanences. Okay, so each cell actually has a specific relationship 
um, to uh, the potential cells in the input space based on this permanence value. So these red squares that I show are not connected. And like here I am over here because the connection threshold is 0 0.1 and the current permanence for this connection from this column to that input cell is only 0 0.8. If I go into this cell, it's uh, beyond the connection threshold. So there's a blue dot there. So there's actually a connection from this column to this input space right now. Um, all the red ones, there is no connections. So that's that's basically just the initial random state. Each one of these columns has has a different relationship with the input space and, a, and, a, and an initial set of connections to the input space uh, based upon those, those permanence values. Um, and these are learned over time. So I'm going to uh, talk about, um, I do random SP. Yeah, let's talk about overlapping learning rules here. And so this, as this is instantiating, let's see. All right, so here we have an input space on the left um, and, a, and a representation of some input. This is, I'm just throwing in some, some, uh, some input here just to show you an example. And here's the spatial cooler's relationship to that, not only the input space, but also this particular input. So I'm, uh, so we can see, for example, this column has uh, an overlap score of 37. That means there are 37 green dots that overlap the, of its connections that overlap with the current input space, which is the, the blue shaded area here. Um, all of these gray dots are connections that fall outside of that space, okay? And each one of these columns has a completely different relationship with that space, a completely different overlap score. This one is 30, for example, this one's 33. Here, the green ones are the ones that are, have the highest amount of overlap with the input space. So what I've done over here on the right is I've sorted all of the overlap scores for every single column and stacked rank them here. And I've drawn a line, you can see like right here, and I'm gonna say everything above this line, those columns will now become active. And this is uh, it, it, exactly how uh, your, your brain is also uh, doing this at every step. Um, it decides which columns are going to be activated based upon their relationship with the input space. Take, for example, this column. It has 44 bits that fall within this input encoding. It, it has become activated. Now that it has become activated, it will learn. So what that means is that all of the gray dots that fall outside of this encoding in the input space, all of those permanence values from this column to each gray dot will be decremented. That means it will start forgetting those connections. All of the green dots that fall within this particular input encoding will be incremented, thus strengthening this column's relationship with those input cells. And I'll show you how over time uh, this looks in, in our next visualization. Um, and so, yeah, so let's talk about learning. So in this, visualization, I'm going to run two spatial coolers. I'm going to have one, which I call a random spatial cooler, which has learning turned off. So all it is is just those initial random permanences that it, that it uh, maps to the input space. It doesn't learn at all throughout its life cycle. Uh, the other one, the learning spatial cooler down here, it, is, uh, it has learning turned on. Um, so we'll start to see over time that uh, the learning spatial cooler starts to deviate from the random one and um, create uh, representations that better match the semantics of similar input data that it's seen previously. Um, and it's gonna take a, a little while to progress here uh, because I've got uh, video recording on and uh, this is a compute heavy process. But what I can show you here let me get to a good point. <clears throat> so these dots, um, I'm not sure how well you guys can see this, but whoops. Okay. Uh, 
these dots, ah, sorry, technical difficulties. There we go. These dots here, as, as I move forward, um, so I'm comparing the, uh, the SDR that I'm getting from each spatial pooler, the active columns, uh, at every time step. So let me get this one. Here's a good example. Right here, at this time step, I'm looking at this SDR representation from the one that's learning, and I'm comparing that, its overlap score, uh, I'm comparing it to all of the other active column representations that this spatial pooler has created in the past. And I am kind of plotting a heat map of dots here that shows the green are the most similar to this current state. The red is the most dissimilar to this current state. And it's showing exactly what I would expect it to. The, the points in the past that are most similar to this point, which would be you know the beginning of the day, uh, um, not on a not on one of these downturns. Those are the most similar. Um, and as as we continue to move through, you'll see that happen. You know, as this as we go down, the green bars go to the bottom. As we go up, the green bars go to the top. And um, and it performs better with the learning spatial pooler. And generally, you can take a snapshot and see right away. Obviously, this is better because. Where I'm at now is more semantically similar uh, to the same points in the past than, than the random spatial pooler is showing. So this is showing you that the learning is actually making a difference um, and helping better represent the spatial correlations within this input space. OK. Um, one second. So. The last visualization I'm going to show you is a beta of something that I've been working on. So this is the temporal memory algorithm. So the whole point of this spatial pooling thing is to create a normalized space that we can run temporal memory algorithm upon. And so this space, like I said, each one of these is a column of cells, and that's what we get represented here. For example, Here's an active cell in the spatial pooler columns, which is an active column. This is the same exact one in the temporal memory. So each one of these dots maps to a dot in this three-dimensional space here. And I'm going to show you, um, I'm, I can't explain all of this right now, but I do want to show you. Uh, so I'm, I'm sending it a very trivial pattern here. Let me just run it. And so you can see this pattern is just blah, 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 going from top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom. And as you can see over here in the temporal memory, it is, it is uh, making predictions of what it's going to see next. Um, so the key is the blue ones are um, currently active cells that were correctly predicted from the last time step. The red ones are predictive cells that it thinks, th these cells think they're going to be active next. And remember, the, compute, the computing objects in this, in this model are the neurons themselves. So this cell is making the decision whether it thinks it will be active next based upon all of its connections to the input space and to, uh, to neighboring cells, which I haven't talked about at this point, but, uh, but I don't have time to go into. But, it, but this temporal memory system also has uh, intercellular relationships as well. So it can it uh, observes what it's seen around it um, and, and to help it make predictions. So, uh, so as we move forward, uh, it, if we're not seeing any yellow cells, yellows are inactive cells, or, I'm sorry, yellow are active cells, but that have not been correctly predicted. Um, so if we're not seeing yellow cells, then it's it's perfectly predicting the the input. Now, um, the the very first uh, part of the sequence, it, it it never quite knows about because I'm I'm resetting the sequence at the end. So the first uh, step in the sequence is always sort of anomalous. Um, once it sees it though, it knows what the next step's going to be, and it's and it's spot on throughout the next uh, all the next steps in the sequence. So the interesting thing here, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to let this run a little bit because it, I'm basically, uh, you know, I'm training it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm establishing uh, a learning here. It's, it's learning this spatial uh, pattern. 
even though it's a very trivial pattern, it does, it takes some time for all of those connections uh, to, to become established as permanence values to increase and decrease. So now what I'm going to do is, let me pause this. Let me go a little further here. Uh, I've got, I'm going to shake it up, right? So <laughs> instead of going all from top to bottom, there's going to be a little jitter in here. It's going to go like one, two, and then bounce down and then bounce back up and then continue. So the first uh, pattern that we see, we know we, we, we're not sure what it is because it's just the first thing we've seen, but we're making a prediction for the next one. Yes, we were correct about the prediction. And now the next prediction that's predicting these cells are going to be active. But when we move forward, uh, the jitter hasn't happened yet. It'll happen in the next cycle. So let's do this again. Okay, so now, now it's predicting that these red cells are gonna be active. When we move forward now, something unexpected happened because instead of moving into this section of cells, it jumped ahead. So the some of the cells that it predicted apparently were, uh, were correctly predicted, but a bunch of them that actually activated were not. So you, it can tell at this point um, that something unexpected happened. And again, it goes back up now. And again, something unexpected happened. It's It sort of has some predictive cells that it thinks, because it's seen those bits before, but just not in the sequence. So now I'm going to just let this run for a while and, and let it learn that there are basically two patterns here. One goes all the way down. The next one just does a little jitter. All the way down, the next one does a little jitter. OK, so now it's it, eventually it will learn both of those patterns. And at some point, it has to decide uh, what's coming up next. So let's stop right here now that it's learned these uh, some of these patterns. And I'm going to step forward. And at this point, this is the point where it could go here or it could go here. So look at all these predictive cells. It's many more predictive cells than the last time we did this because it's seen both of these things. It's seen this happen and it's seen this happen. It's seen both of those contexts. When we move forward, some of those are going to be correct and some of them, well, actually, it, it totally correctly predicted that. So, <laughs> uh, but as it should at some point get, uh, so that, yeah, so this was the one that it got confused on. Uh, but I think it probably just needs to, to see this pattern a few times. Typically, uh, we're it'll see you know, thousands of data points before we would consider this, this model um, to have enough knowledge about the input space. Um, so, uh, so thanks for bearing with me on this one. I, I just created this visualization on Friday, so I'm still sort of working through it. Um, but uh, now I am going to uh, go, go ahead with my slides. I might have a little bit of time to take questions at the end, but let's, I'm gonna finish out with these slides. Uh, and there'll be more resources to talk about. So one of the big points I want to make is that these are really just the foundational aspects of neocortically inspired intelligence. These are um, the the building blocks of of creating an intelligent thing based upon uh, the neocortex. And I truly believe that this is the future, not of AI, because I don't like the term AI, this is the future of intelligent machines, or even better, non-biological intelligence. Because I like to define AI not as what people think of AI as today, because I don't think we have AI today. I want truly intelligent machines. And I think the way to get there is to start with the biology of something that we know is intelligent and to try and reverse engineer that, which is what we're doing at Dementa. So I have a lot of resources for learning more about this. Um, I've been working over the past year on a YouTube series that takes all of these concepts that, that I've been explaining to you, except for temporal memory. I haven't done those yet, but I will be working on those soon, um, and breaks them out in short, you know, 15 minute videos. So start with bit arrays. I mean, these are for absolute laymen. If you've never heard of this before, even if you're not a computer scientist, you could still follow along. Um, and then talking about SDRs, their capacity, comparison, overlap sets, subsampling, et cetera and all the way up into spatial cooler and learning. And I'll be working on temporal memory episodes uh, within the next several months. Um, just a reminder, this is all open source code. All of our HTM implementations are open source. We've got a, a strong community uh, around these HTM technology. Uh, we've been open source for over three years now. 
Um, we've got a, a, a forum. Uh, we'd love for you guys to join our community and help us try and build these intelligent machines. There's a lot of discussion on our forum. It's called HTM Forum. And oh, by the way, to find these HTM school series, just Google HTM school. It's the first thing that comes up. It's not an ad. And also, uh, you can Google HTM forum. It's the first thing that comes up. That's not an ad. And as, or also go to discourse.numenta.org. Um, I read this forum all the time. If you have any questions, this is a very good place to add, uh, to ask your questions. Um, so uh, one, one last thing I want to note um, is that all of this being said, this approach in no way trivializes the work of the machine learning pioneers like these who have been working on these really hard problems for decades. Um, I have great amount of respect for all of our machine learning pioneers that have been um, tirelessly trying to implement intelligence and, and artificial neural networks for years. Um, we absolutely need people like this. Uh, it's just that from my approach, I'm not by trade or by education a computer scientist. Um, so I came through this approach reading this book called On Intelligence. Uh, this book was a product of the Redwood Neuroscience or the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. So this guy, Jeff Hawkins, is my boss. If you don't know who he is, he founded Palm. He created the Palm Pilot um, and Handspring and, and all that stuff. Uh, but his passion has really always been intelligence and the brain. So when he um, was done with Palm and mobile computing, he founded the Redwood Science for Theoretical, uh, excuse me, the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. And then that was a big source of the book on intelligence. I read this book in 2006 and I was extremely intrigued by it and motivated to try and figure out. I thought this is the right way to, to try and build truly intelligent machines. You know, start with what we know and move on from there. So from that, um, Numenta was founded based upon the work of the Redwood Neuroscience uh, Center, and uh, it was donated, the Redwood Center was uh, donated to Berkeley and still exists today as a theoretical neuroscience institute. So, um, so I hope you understand that we're just coming from a different approach. I feel like our, our approach has a better chance of getting us to truly intelligent machines than the current machine learning landscape uh, not that that trivializes all the work that all of these great pioneers have done uh, for decades in the past. So um, that's basically my presentation. So thanks everybody for uh, for watching. And I'll see if I can address any of these questions here um, real quick before my time's up. Let's see. These grids are blue. I don't know uh, much about the subtotrons. Uh, and it's, it is okay for some to be wrong. It's a very, uh, your brain's a very fault tolerant system. So, um, for example, if you have a stroke, you can, in many cases, you can recover, even though you've had significant neurological damage. So, uh, the, the brain is very plastic. And so we've tried to make this technology as plastic as possible as well. Um, so the encodings were all created by hand. They're, the encoding algorithms are basically uh, just code. That and it, and we have a suite of encoders already that exist in NuPic. NuPic is uh, the Numenta platform for intelligent computing. Um, go to our forums or, or go to numenta.org, numenta.com to find out more about it. Um, but we already have encoders like date-time encoders that I showed you, scalar encoders, delta encoders. We even have a geospatial coordinate encoder, which is really cool. Uh, it actually will translate the semantics of geospatial uh, information into SDRs. Um, so you can do uh, stuff like um, anomaly detection on routes of objects moving through time and space, which is uh, really useful. I think it's one of the coolest things that we can do. Um, see a cortical columns. So what I'm uh, what this is representing is actually a very small cross section of layer two, three of one region of cortex. So we're talking like one mill. I mean, this is extremely small scale, but typically I think we create a grid of 65,000 or so cells, 32 columns per cell. Um, and that is a representation of layer two, three of the cortex. Um, there is no hierarchy in our current implementation, although we have implemented hierarchy in the past. 
um, or, or we wanted to get just one layer right. Um, how do you persist the data? Uh, we don't. The data is not persisted. Uh, it is learned over time. So uh, the only representation of the data that exists in an HTM system at any point in time exists in the permanence values between the cells. Um, so you can't go back and replay that input data ever. Just like in your brain, you remember what it feels like to be six years old, but you can't reverse time and go back and feel and, and get the exact input you got when you're six, six years old. The sensory input flows through your brain and, and goes away. The only thing that's left over is what connections were created and, and, and disconnected over time. Um, okay, so I think that's it. Uh, like I said, any questions, uh, Q&A, you can email me at matt at nementa.org or go to discourse.nementa.org. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for watching my presentation. And I would be happy to address any further questions uh, offline. Thanks very much.